Welcome to episode four of Crossroads of Destiny and Avatar The Last Airbender Universe podcast. Right now, we're talking about every episode of Nickelodeon's Avatar The Last Airbender, one at a time. I'm Chad Hopkins, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Andrew and Melanie Grant. How are you two doing? Doing great. We are here. It's been a couple weeks since we last recorded, actually, because you guys went traveling, and it's just, it's been a couple weeks, and so it's, it's nice to sit down around the table again and watch some Avatar and podcast. Absolutely. We've been looking forward to it very much. Mm -hmm. Now, Andrew, I want to talk about something that's happened in your life recently because you have decided oh. to represent <laughs> our airbenders everywhere to yes. shave your head. That's the reason, yes? There's absolutely no other reason why I would have shaved <laughs> my head. It's definitely not because both of us have been balding since we were in college. Yeah, way too soon. But yeah. here we are. And I almost sent something to Chad the other day and was just like, when you're done talking about air nomads and decide to join them. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I'm I am I have shaved all of the hair off the top of my head. Yeah, I must say it suits you. Oh, thank you. Okay, like I, I got the video and I wasn't like overly shocked. I was like, <laughs> I'm probably not that far from doing Do it myself yourself. at some point. <laughs> so one day, who knows? We'll see. But anyways. Going forward, everybody, we're going to just go ahead and jump into our episode. So we are talking about book one, chapter five of The Last Airbender. This is The King of Omashu. It was directed by Anthony Leoy, was written by John O'Brien, and aired on March 18th of 2005. And since we're tracking the animation studios from South Korea that are working on this show, this one was animated by DR Movie, who also animated the third episode when we went to the Southern Air Temple. Hey everybody, this is Chad from the future, realizing from editing that I completely skipped over reading my summary when we recorded this episode. So I'm going to insert it in right here and then we'll get right back into things. Aang is taking Katara and Sokka on another stop that is not the Northern Water Tribe, this time to visit an old stomping ground of his, riding on the giant slide mail delivery system of Omashu, which is a city of the Earth Nation. He tries to hide the fact that he's the Avatar after the attack of Zuko on Kyoshi last episode, but he's still discovered and given three challenges by the crazy king of Omashu. Starting off, is there anything we want to say about the story or like fun things that stood out to us that aren't as deep in discussion for us to linger on? I was super excited that we got to see Earthbenders. I love earthbending. That's the only element we've been waiting for, correct? Like we've seen a little, a little bit of everything. everything else. Yeah. 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 So. We haven't seen like hardcore waterbending yet. No, that's true. But it was just really cool to see how different the way they kind of summon what their powers are. I really enjoyed that. We got some more really good fight scenes. That final scene that I'm sure we're going to linger on in a little bit between the king and Aang is so cool. I was commenting on it while we were watching. I was like, man, this part, this part, that's so cool. <laughs> I love earth bending. I don't know if I would say it's my favorite kind of bending. I don't know if I could make that kind of intellectual decision right now, but I do really like earth bending and I love the creativity it affords earth benders. Looking at the city of Omashu when we first approach it, it is a fortress on a mountain, not unlike the Southern Air Temple was. It's just not as high. Right. But then you have to think about because of their ability to manipulate the earth around them, there's only one path in. And you have to imagine that should it come to that and they are invaded or attacked by the Fire Nation, they could close down that pathway like it's nothing. And they could make themselves pretty impenetrable to Fire Nation attacks. Which might be why Omashu is still up and running as an Earth Kingdom after 100 years of battling that was something war. that i was going to mention is that i thought it was really interesting how many soldiers they still had mm -hmm. the only other element that we've seen that had that has been the fire nation right so they they still have a good amount of people that are in their army that are able to still do all of the powers we haven't like gotten this information from anywhere yet and i don't think we necessarily get it from something so it's not a spoiler but omashu is sort of like the weapons manufacture center for the earth kingdom and so you even got a sense of that when, when they were riding on the mail chute and they had those spears come up behind them. That's because that's what they do. They create weapons to defend themselves against the Fire Nation. I think we've also seen briefly when we see maps that the Earth Kingdom is quite expansive. Mm -hmm. So even if they had been troubled by the Fire Nation or even dwindled down to some degree, we're still talking about a very, very large empire that is the Earth Kingdom. 
And you have to think too that should their territory be encroached on or something, maybe one reason that their territory is so expansive is because it's not like they can create earth, but even ocean is built on bedrock, you know? So mm. they, they could probably summon up earth just about anywhere as long as they have access to even seafloor. With an earthbender powerful enough to do mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. yeah. And then you look at the city and when they first enter, they don't have doors. They oh, yeah. earthbend this gap to allow people in and then they earthbend it closed. And it's literally just a solid sheet of very thick rock. And then we see that in the refurbished chamber <laughs> as well. <laughs> it was that chamber before. As soon as they close them in, Melanie's like, there's no doors. Right. Which is awesome. Yeah, and it makes it, a great it, prison. It, it makes a great <laughs> prison for sure. Even a newly refurbished chamber is still... That used to be the old chamber. Used to be the old chamber. Used to be the bad chamber. That was formerly bad. <laughs> That's something that I mentioned whenever they entered into Amashu. Was, I was like, there's a, another really cool door scene that we saw with the air temple prior. He used his air in order to kind of get the lock undone. And then we see this other really cool representation of a door opening into another city. Mm-hmm. And it was the big chunks of rock just opening. I thought that, I mean, that was really cool. It's such a minor detail, but it makes sense that the same animation company did the one with the Air Temple and it kind of translated into this episode too. It does seem like a very small thing, but I also think it's very creative the sense that someone sat down and be like, why would people of the Earth Kingdom open a door the same way people of the Air Kingdom do? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Not only that, they go as far as say, why would he even be a normal door? Why would it be a door? You can kind of see the thought pattern behind why you have a, an entire nation of people who can move Earth. Why would they have a door? They can literally move whatever's in their way with Earth bending. So I think it's just, it really goes to the creative nature of the show to really think through what a group of people who have the same power be able to do with their kingdom and we see that like as soon as the earth kingdom is introduced we see that in droves like we see all kinds of how their 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 entire economy is set up how their building structures are set up everything within the earth kingdom is earth related and therefore can be utilized to its maximum capacity by people who earth bend question did you guys notice and this is a genuine question not Did you see a lot of stairs in Omashu? This is me thinking through the city layout. Are there Mm -hmm. stairs? I mean, it's a stacked city. It goes up tall. It's kind of pyramid shaped in certain ways. And so I wonder if because they have no need for stairs and their entire fortress is made of stone and earth, they can just lift themselves up. And then the way back down for obviously the Mm. male system is is through the chutes. It's gravity, yeah. But I mean, I would have to double check that. Don't take that. As, too far, yeah. yeah like I, I don't remember seeing a lot of things. I mean, obviously, it's a very stacked city, mm-hmm. but I don't, I mean, we, you fly through the city, so it's, yeah. it's hard to think back of whether there were stairs or not. Even if there are stairs, I mean, you have to think they do have that capability like, yeah. to just create an elevator for themselves. Mm-hmm. We also were introduced to one of the series' most important characters, the Cabbage Man. <laughs> I, my cabbages. <laughs> I wrote in my notes first, RIP that guy's cabbages. And then later, RIP cabbages again. And then one more time, RIP cabbages times three. Rotten luck. Sorry, guy. Or multiple guys. I don't even know. How, how, where did he get all these cabbages? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if, if he's cabbage man, he has to have cabbages somewhere, right? That, that's true. I can't argue with that logic. Okay. Um, malicious destruction of cabbages. You didn't say your thing about cabbages. Oh, as we might have mentioned once or twice before, <laughs> Melanie and I are currently pregnant. And yesterday she brought up the fact that my second son is roughly the size of a cabbage. And when she said it, not knowing this episode, I went, my cabbages. And then she was like, uh-huh. yeah, it, it didn't make any sense. Right. So <laughs> uh, without context, it's not funny, but I thought it was hilarious. And then I shared that with Chad and he thought it was rather amusing as well. I'm pretty sure I was just like, okay, yeah, that was <laughs> whatever. So he's about two pounds now. <laughs> like, yeah. just like, lost over the fact that he said that at all. That happens fairly often. That's fine. <laughs> The sliding 
made my anxiety go through the roof <laughs> because like the different scenes that they were the angles that they were showing and how steep the actual slide itself was like I've literally had nightmares about something like that and it, it was really cool it was really well done I love that it was still really whimsical and fun and at the same time they had just a little touch of like peril with their when the their cart met up with the cart that had the weapons in it I was like that could suck if yeah. someone got hurt they just glance over like oh okay yeah 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 <laughs> and then the the lanes merge and all of a sudden it's creeping up behind them yeah, like, oh. and then after they've sort of escaped that error and they've rode on a couple of rooftops and then they make it back to the chute katara says ang do something use your airbend and he's like yes that could make this go so much faster <laughs> No, that's not what she had in mind. Oh, my God. Completely oh, oblivious to the fact that she was like, save us. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about the fun. I like how this tiny little boy, everywhere he goes, he seems to have just like a line of destruction that he does. He doesn't mean to, but like he tore up so many roofs and destroyed the cabbage guy again. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's all a good fun. He doesn't mean to do it. It's just he's funny. I like the slide system just because... It always plays back to the power of earthbending. You know that no one else has a system like this. Mm -hmm. Like this is not only, well, key to Omashu, but more than likely it can be, I guess, implied that most of the Earth Kingdom is going to be like this to some degree. So what I always enjoyed was the fact that you're seeing like what earthbending in all of its power, how it would affect daily life when you're surrounded by other earthbenders supplying the needs of other earthbenders like i just think it's it's really cool how the whole city of omashu was just kind of thought out both in in the context of the cartoon but also in the context of the story like you know those are fairly different things not only was it done for the story but it was someone was sitting there was just like okay this isn't a normal city this is a city that is literally built from people who can move earth with their own physical power. And then like just going on step by step saying, okay, what does this look like? What does this look like? How do they move their mail? Like who cares? But at the same time, you're like, Oh, this is very different. This is, you know, they're utilizing their abilities on an everyday basis just to move simple stuff here to there, their, their commerce is done through earthbending. And I think that is something just really cool to explore. Well, I think the cool thing about earthbending in general is that it seems to have daily application different than the other three elements would. Like, how are you going to use airbending in your normal day-to-day life to do normal daily things? I mean, I'm sure there's something like dry your laundry quicker or something, <laughs> but... <laughs> That would be amazing. That would be amazing. (laughs) But it's not like opening doors or transporting goods or operating your commerce. Firebending would destroy everything. Or, I mean, I was thinking on a smaller scale, like you can (laughs) eat your tea or you can start your fireplace. (laughs) But sure, you could destroy things too. And we have seen the Earth, the the, the Fire Nation do that. Apparently, I just go. I was thinking in the context of day to day life. (laughs) Day to day life. (laughs) I mean, if I had that ability, I would be constantly afraid of like, oh crap, I just set my curtains on fire or whatever. Y'all shut up. (laughs) Water bending, too. I mean, there's there's always like going to be specific applications for each nation's abilities, but earth bending just seems to have the widest base of application. Right. I mean, because I mean, when you think about it and any kind of ancient culture, they had some form of inhabitants built from earth or heavily utilizing earth. So this is one of the first times we get to see a bending skill that has like an actual building material that can be moved. Like a function. Right. And so if I can earth bend, that means I can create literal walls around me in a matter of seconds. And now I've built a house. Right. I can't do that with fire or, or, or air. Like, that isn't effective. So, like, I would have been very disappointed if we saw an Earth Kingdom look like the Southern Water Tribe. Right. Because 
hello. Like y'all, y'all couldn't come up with anything better than that. So you see that the lack of, and I, I think this is important to bring up is since the Southern water tribe is essentially devoid of benders, except for Katara, you don't have these grand structures. You don't have a lot of infrastructure because bending isn't part of their lives. So they're developing like they would any other city. That's what, and that kind of brought up to what Sokka said whenever he saw their, their temple, he was just like, theirs don't melt. Like they stay yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the same thing. We, buildings we, that don't melt? It's the same thing we saw Kyoshi last episode. That's a city full of no benders. And it's just a normal town. Like they, they built the structures. It's fairly typical. But here you have something that was designed with earth bending in mind. And heavily utilized within as well. Like not only just to build it, but to make it function requires earth benders. And so I think that's just, I think it's just really cool because even subconsciously, like a lot of it's kind of background, not necessarily pushed upon, is that when you see cutscenes of any part of Omashu, you're seeing earthbending, like the guys that are moving all the stuff and lifting things and pushing and pulling a lot of these heavy carts and stuff that are moving throughout the city, they're all earthbending. And so we're focused on Aang sliding down, but you also see everyone else is just doing their job and that requires earthbending. And I've, I always find that like really cool, not just to have an awesome power, but to also have this kind of like ultimate functionality of a power as well. And, so, and then seeing it implemented into like someone's daily life. Just a couple more fun things before we get into the heavier discussion. I, I loved seeing as they entered the city when they were interrogating Aang, who has disguised himself as this old man. He comes up with this nonsense name. It's Pippin Padlopsicopolis <laughs> right off the bat. And it's like, okay, well, how are you expecting to keep up that name? I don't expect you to remember that name 20 seconds from now. Yet when the ruse needs to be continued, Katara steps up and she's just like, oh, and I'm, I'm his granddaughter, Pippin Padlopsicopolis. <laughs> and so I, I love how quick on her feet Katara is and how she was just so quickly falling into Aang's fantasy that he's creating and making it more believable. And at the same time, she's being called trustworthy. Good job, <laughs> Katara. Way to go. <laughs> Anything else that we wanted to say that's just sort of like fun? Well, we can mention Momo again, because I think I'm in every episode that that little creature is in, I want to mention him because he's my spirit animal. Momo tracking 2020? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the heavier stuff, or not even just heavier stuff. This isn't a heavy episode, but just no. like the, the deeper discussion stuff. They've obviously learned after their experience on Kiyoshi, because when they arrived on Kiyoshi, Ang was just like, oh, well, by the way, I'm the airbender, please release us. And then he enjoyed the fame for all of 30 seconds before Zuko shows up and nearly burns the village down. And so they walk into Amashu a little bit wiser, thinking, okay, we better keep this a secret because we saw what happened last time. And we don't want to bring the Fire Nation here as well. And so at least they enter the city with good intentions as far as keeping a low profile until the whole sliding thing. But that's that's Aang's own adventure. Can't help himself. What I find amusing is that they're only at Omashu to go sliding. Mm-hmm. And they know that they have to hide the fact that he's the Avatar. <laughs> you mentioned that when we were so, watching it too. So instead of just not going to Omashu, they literally take on a complete new set of identities mm-hmm. just so they can enter the city, just so they can go sledding in Omashu before Aang actually has to do all of his stuff that he needs to do as the Avatar. Well, if anything, that kind of goes to his dedication to his list that he wants to complete. I suppose, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's fair. He's very tenacious in wanting to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. I just find it amusing that he knows that he has to be careful. He <laughs> knows that he has to go under in disguise and is not there for any real legitimate reason and still does it anyway. I will say in his defense for this, though, we see almost immediately before anything crazy happens that the reason he wanted to come to Omashu of all places is, yes, for the fun, but also because that fun is tied back to a memory he had with a person, with a friend. His friend Boomy. His friend Boomy, who we do find out. I I have to compliment Melanie. I can't objectively say whether this is an obvious thing after having known this for a long time over my various rewatches of the show. But as soon as we saw 
old Boomy, Melanie was just like, oh, that's Boomy. Like, <laughs> there was no yeah, was, guessing game. There was, was way no, on top of that. Like, yeah. There was no being dragged along like, oh, I wonder who this guy is. And so within two seconds of meeting old <laughs> Boomy, Melanie was just like, oh, that's his friend. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> like, and here, Andrew and I are sitting to the sides and we're just like, Mm-hmm. Yes, sure. Okay. Think what you want. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Wait and see. Yeah. Like trying to be as vague as we can. It was just this crazy eyes, man. Like, Yeah. I actually remember watching this episode mm-hmm. and I did not recognize King Boomy as friend Boomy. I did make the connection that you look a lot like Aang's friend. Maybe you're like some weird grand descendant mm-hmm. that has taken over the throne of Omashu. Mm-hmm. And so now the king should know Aang, but it wouldn't be his hundred and something year old friend. It would be his son or something like that. Right. But the eyes were definitely a hint. He's got that his same teeth. like weird look, but also the, the music that plays oh. first during the There's flashback, the, the music that plays during the flashback. And then when we, anytime he has a weird moment, like when he says his uh, lettuce leaf line and then we slowly watch him eat a lettuce leaf there's this music that plays and it's like a, a kooky carnival kind of thing oh bum, yeah bum, 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 bum. it's like this little weird waltz and it's it's definitely trying to make that connection for you and it, it's more noticeable in rewatches for sure one day i will be as observant as you guys to these minute details one day one oh, day music well, that's all chad i yeah. i would have never picked <laughs> well, up right that. but you brought up the map earlier i was like i had no freaking recollection of what the map looked like oh okay yeah well, they show it in the opener, and they show it on a couple of times when you when mm-hmm. Zoom goes in the picture. I mean, I guess I will have to say I'm I'm a lot more focused on the actual moves that the different mm. or, or the benders are doing. So yeah, no, the map was secondary for sure. So something we were commenting on while we were waiting to record, at least, is that Aang comments on how friendly the people of Omashu are, or at least how they were, and the reason that the people of Omashu are still around is maybe because they aren't as nice as Aang remembers them being. I mean, RIP that guy's cabbage, the first time it happens is because they launch him off the bridge because they didn't want him in the city selling cabbages. He says that they didn't want want rotten cabbages in their city, so they literally catapulted his cart off of the mountain. If that's how you want to control commerce in your city, sure. Do Uh, you, (laughs) 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 boo-boo. So... Yeah, Aang remembers them as friendly, but it's clear that maybe they aren't as friendly as they used to be, and that's why they're still around. That's why they're still ticking. And I'm already at the fight. Do you have anything to say before the fight? I kind of wanted us to touch a little bit more on the king himself. Okay, yeah, then go ahead. I just thought he had a very good balance between him being super serious and like ominous with, I'm going to take your friends, and you have to figure out the challenges and get them back. But then he, like you said, he has this like really weird kooky side and he's kind of, they keep mentioning it. He's saying, this guy's nuts or this guy's crazy. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was like a really good mesh between it again to bring back the, the theme of this still being a child show or a kid show. It's trying to show darker themes, but at the same time, keep it lighthearted. I thought that was really funny where he was just. She goes, let us leave. And he was like, let us leave. <laughs> <laughs> just jumps on the let us Which leave. is just a super old person thing to do. It's like not only misunderstand someone, but also then make a pun out of it. Yeah, like, it's like it was a super like, dad joke. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, and he's super, super dad. Like he's old. He does the same thing when Aang says, oh, yeah, we're from uh, Kangaroo Island. And he says, oh, that place is really hopping. <laughs> And then he waits for the yeah. laughter too. <laughs> every <laughs> time, every time something awkward happens in this episode, the captions we, we watch with captions on just because, and it, it always says "man coughs." It's just like somebody's in the background going, <clears throat> <laughs> "He did it again." <laughs> There's so. a pause for effect. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. The very first thing that happens before the challenges is they're in the newly refurbished chamber that was once bad. <laughs> and Katara's like, well, we're not going to stick around to find out what these challenges are. And so even now, their, their first instinct is to take the, the airbender path and evade conflict. And so they try to escape, but again, made of rocks. They can't get out. Momo's even too big to fit through the air ducts. He's too fat. He's too fat. I love it. He's been eating too much. So. Aang is forced to confront these challenges, especially when he wakes to find his friends have been taken. Not only do these challenges present Aang with 
challenges, he has to complete them to get his friends back as they're slowly being encased in Creeping Crystal. I guess that can lead us into the discussion of the challenges themselves. Like, I like how he's <laughs> giving narration to what Aang is doing. He's like, oh, yeah, no one's d- thought of that before whenever he's trying to get him to get the key for his lunchbox. Oh, yeah, like, way to go, Aang. <laughs> no one's thought of that before. Yeah, like- <laughs> it's very, like, sarcastic, and right. I appreciated it. I would like to see somebody who's not an airbender, or I guess a waterbender, attempt those challenges. Like, why is that set up the way it is? Did they do that specifically for Aang? I guess, I, I guess that could be said. They, they set up that at least that first challenge specifically for Aang. Maybe, but it kind of gave the hint to that this was been done before. Yeah, because he says nobody's thought of that before. Who, who did they test with the... the- water in the key before poor unfortunate and who soul. else's family is encased in rock candy right now right <laughs> <That's a good laughs> <one>. genomite <laughs> i thought after that i was like i would have totally licked that at first me like what? you just lick all the rocks well i mean if okay. it, it smelled sweet oh i'm sure God. if it was candy <laughs> <laughs> and so we see we already talked a little bit about the key in the water we already talked we didn't talk about flopsy that was super clever. I, they had me totally going. I was like, it's a little bunny with floppy ears. I was like, that's such a cute name. And then Flopsy is totally, it's like Harry Potter. Fluffy, not fluffy. Yeah. <laughs> Giant three-headed dog. Yeah, I think there's a word for that where the name, well, I guess it, would it kind of be oxymoron? Essentially, yeah. I, I think there's another word that I'm thinking of, but I think oxymoron works too, where the, the name doesn't sort of befit as a descriptor. But anyways, we get Flopsy. That's a short little challenge. The third challenge is the coolest one because Aang is challenged to a duel. And hey, it's cool. You get to pick who you battle. And so he's presented with two tough looking guys as options. Now, I've got to say, because they're carrying around weapons, I would think that they're not benders. And so sure. maybe that would have been a smart choice. Yeah, because- <laughs> typically, that typically seems to be the case when you have someone who carries a weapon, they're typically not a Bender. Right, because otherwise you have the elements as your weapons. Right. Yeah. So maybe they weren't benders. Maybe not. Maybe that would have been the smarter choice for Aang, because we do find out that Boomy is not this frail old king. Dude. He cracks his knuckles and he stands up tall and takes off his cloak and, and he's ripped. He is ripped. He is like, buff. What the heck? That yeah. was the biggest psych out <laughs> of the entire thing. Yeah, he was super cut. Like yeah. man had like V's going down his and front. He's and like over a hundred years old. Uh-huh. And we ha- right now we have to take him at his word. He says he is the most powerful earthbender you will ever meet. Mm. And so that's something to sort of hold on to because I mean we saw some pretty crazy stuff. He he is a formidable foe for sure. And something that really works in the context of knowing that he's boomy and regarding something that we talked about previously boomy has fought airbenders before i was going to bring that up (laughs) boomy has experience with it and so where we talked about how the firebenders were helpless because they had no clue how to face ang how to uh, prevent him escaping how to hold him in check boomy's been there yeah and he makes sure that Aang can't face this duel by just flying away. And that's one thing I was going to bring up as we were watching the scene unfold. I was kind of like a little annoyed with Aang at first whenever King Bumi was kind of destroying him with all of his, his earthbending. I was like, okay, we've totally seen you demolish the Fire Nation. Why are you acting like an office all of a sudden? Like, why can't you do this? And it goes to back what both of you were connecting just now is just is because he knows what to do. He's he been around. Stop. He knows how to stop him for sure. He's obviously been in close contact with the airbenders as we saw in the in the cutback with Aang and Boomy. So I mean, they were good friends. Does that mean they sparred all the time? No. But since Aang disappeared, somewhere in that time, King Boomy was around. So what when things started getting really tumultuous he would have been involved. And so obviously not necessarily fighting airbenders, but would have at least been exposed to their techniques. And he even says it just like an airbender trying to evade and avoid. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, Oh my God, he knows he does. He's done this before. He knows their, their move sets. He knows what's going on. And when Aang tries to fly away, he doesn't, he stops throwing rocks 
at Aang and affects his environment to where he can no longer evade. And that's why he's, he shoots a rock at the ceiling to where things fall down on him instead of trying to aim exactly for Aang. Because he knows. He knows that as an airbender, that is going to be his move, is to dodge. But you can't dodge 17 things falling from the ceiling. And that's what he mentioned, too. He was just like, you can't. What did he say? He's like, you have to fight me eventually or something like that. Yeah, yeah. He's like, you're going to have to stand up at some point. Right. He even says, how are you going to get me from way over there? Right. And I think that's what made this one of, up to this point, one of the more intense fights that we've ever seen is because it's versus an old master of an element, King Boomy, versus someone that we already know is highly capable, although maybe not the greatest airbender. Well, I mean, he is the greatest because he's the only one, but that's beside the point. (laughs) He obviously is very capable of doing things and has additional power as being the avatar. So you have this kind of master versus master fight and they go that extra mile to really prove the fact that we're not dealing with just normal people. We're not dealing with some grunt from the Fire Nation. We're not dealing with some, you know, mook from the Southern Water Tribe or anything like that. We're dealing with legitimate combatants and that's why i think we you really start to enjoy this battle because you're just like wow there's so many things that they can do like it's like (laughs) every time that they do something you're like i would have known like i mean obviously you don't think like an earthbender and you don't think like an airbender so you're just like wow he just made a tornado so he can throw a, a giant chunk of rock back at boomy but then again boomy was already ready for that too so it was just like it they're just ready you know, tit for tat, the entire battle. And I think that was something that really pulls you in. And it's just like, wow, if there's more of this, Check. sign me up. Like, I'm, I'm here. I'm in it. There's some genuine threat there because you do see how talented Boomy is and how Aang does have to approach things differently, which was the whole point of these challenges to begin with. I don't think this would be an unpopular comparison to make. It's sort of like watching the Star Wars saga and looking at the lightsaber duels in the original trilogy which are slow and like swing, hit, swing, miss, swing. And it's, it's very slow paced. But then you look at the prequel trilogy and I'm not making any quality comparisons as far as like the movies go, but the lightsaber duels in the prequel trilogy, I don't think anybody would argue against. They're much more exciting to watch. And Absolutely. it's sort of the same thing that we get here where we've seen a couple of fights earlier, but it wasn't between two people at this caliber. And I think... With a show like this, you're already kind of thirsty for what else can be done. What will separate King Boomy from any other male clerk earthbender that's just pushing around cabbages all day? Why is King Boomy king? Why is he the most powerful earthbender that Aang will ever meet? And it delivers. It shows ginormous pieces of earth being moved. And like you can tell that that's not necessarily something that every earthbender can do. Mm-hmm. At the very beginning, they're just like kind of small boulders, and he's just punching them at Aang. At the very end, you can tell that there's a, a significant amount of effort to move a significant amount of earth. And so I think that's important to keep and hold on to, because now you know that maybe earthbending isn't the easiest thing, and especially if you're trying to build something, if you're trying to move large amounts, it requires a great deal of strength and it requires a great deal of training. Speaking of the technique of earthbending, since we've talked about how the other bending techniques came from specific martial arts, the martial art that earthbending was based on is called Hung Gar. I can't claim to know a whole lot about that, but there you have it. You can do your research, Hung Gar. And I just want to point out a couple of my favorite moments from that fight as far as the earthbending goes. So yes, there's the throwing of the boulders. There's one where he does this like backwards jump kick. That's really cool. Where he launches the boulder at the ceiling above Aang. That's, that's awesome. That's the first thing that's just like, whoa. He basically like drop kicks the boulder. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's another time where he tucks his arms against his side and does this like sideways stomping technique. And it causes these jutting rocks to come out of the ground that Aang is having to avoid. I love that. And then there's another time where Aang sends a gust of air at him and he launches a flat piece of rock in front of him, makes that joke about it being drafty. (laughs) Someone left a window open. Yeah. (laughs) And then he knocks that flat 
piece of rock over, stands on it like a surfboard, and then launches a wave of rocks out from under it, which just describing it, that sounds really cool. And then you see it happen. Wow. I love that. Absolutely. And you also start to realize that there are some major differences in in bending in general, and that you see how easy it is for Earth to become the defense element. Mm-hmm. Because he did, he literally created, what was that, like a, a foot and a half shield in front of him to completely block Aang's attack. And then used it for offense as well. Whereas when you see any kind of fire bending, it is wholly offensive. There is very little in terms of what you can bend with firebending to actually defend yourself besides what uh, Zuko does. Yeah, where he like diverted it to the ground. But in and of itself, that's just more firebending, Mm -hmm. essentially. So you're not actually utilizing anything as a shield like an earthbender would. And then you have the evasiveness and flightiness of an airbender that we've seen as well. And then we haven't really seen a lot of waterbending fighting techniques so we'll have to delve into that later but I, you're starting to see that each element has a very strong pulling on not only how it's done but it's its main purpose kind of what you were mentioning with how the defensive with the sheet of rock that Bumi uses we've seen that attack that Aang does on that before with the fire nation and how very effective it was against the Fire Nation, and how not effective it was with the Earthbender. He just demolished it. And that was a very powerful move for Aang. Right, because you've seen its effectiveness earlier. Right, and we also saw other instances of Aang being pushed to try new things. That was the whole point of these challenges to begin with. He, at one point during this duel, starts running in a circle and creates a twister. Right. And is able to sort of send a piece of rock back at Boomy. And then when it hits Boomy, he just like goes into a defensive stance and it dissolves around his body. It's so <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm really just like geeking out here. And I, I definitely feel it very much like, granted it came well before, but the, the fight in the Ministry of Magic where the, yeah. the glass is coming at Dumbledore and he puts up like this weird shield and it all just dissolves into sand behind yeah. him. Uh-huh. I was just like, when I saw that in the Harry Potter movie, I was just like, they stole that from Avatar. I was like, that's so rude. I was just like, that, I literally watched King Boomy do that like four years ago. And you know what? It shows that earthbenders like waterbenders can manipulate earth in its different forms of matter. Yeah. Like he dissolves the ground at one point, so Aang sinks into it. He dissolves the big heavy rock that's coming at him into dust into its base sediment right right i forgot about the him being able to sink ang and i just thought of that quicksand uh-huh. and then all those memes that you see on the internet about as a child i thought quicksand was going to be a bigger <laughs> deal as an adult right that's, <laughs> that's all true. i kept thinking <laughs> and then i think one of the funniest parts of this episode is when the battle is over and king boomy just like falls backwards into the ground and Aang is just like, what? Yeah. And he, he teleports up to <laughs> right. he through the rock. He travels through the ground. And I'm just like, okay, so earthbenders are awesome. That's fine. Right. They can literally do everything. I That's have great. to think that that has got to be like really advanced, though. Yeah, you would have to, right? Yeah, I that mean, particular move where you're apparate. transporting. Because what, what that would involve, I'm trying to think through the process in my head. He falls into the ground. And then there's got to be some sort of shift in the matter. And he travels through that matter. And is able to push himself up in while still in the mm-hmm. ground up to the the balcony where Katara and Sokka are, and then emerge. It, it's just really cool. It's really fun watching you guys <laughs> nerd out so hard to like. Let's think through the physics of how this <laughs> would have happened. It's like, that is why we're here. This is what you guys do, and it's just <laughs> like I'm literally like a tennis match back and forth watching <laughs> the both of you. I mean, I I definitely have thought through this as well, like how. I know how the earth would have had to move around the like cocoon of King Boomy as he travels through, through the earth. At least you guys like, are consistent, I guess. I mean, here we are. Yeah. So that leads to the final moments with Boomy where again, we don't know he's Boomy yet. Technically speaking, Melanie, sorry, we, we're not supposed to know. I'm sorry. I'm so <laughs> just observant. <laughs> and so he says, okay, so what is my name? And <laughs> Voice. Wonderful. <laughs> Basically. Um, 
And so he says, okay, what is my name? And so Aang has to think through what the challenges put him through. And Sokka very helpfully offers up, he's an earthbender, Rocky, <laughs> because of all the rocks. And Katara, bless her, does not completely shoot him down this time. She says, we're going to keep trying, but that's a good backup. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't say really much of anything. No. Throughout the whole episode. The, the one interjection is just like, maybe, maybe just shush. We'll put a pin in that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and Aang is able to think through everything and realize, yes, this was Boomy, who once, as we saw in the flashback, did tell him, you've got to open yourself up to the possibilities. And that's what Aang had to do. He had to approach each of these challenges from a different perspective than he was thinking. So to get the key from the water, he used a stalactite. Is that the one that comes from the ground? Stalagmite. I was literally trying to remember the words as the scene was happening. And I couldn't remember. Yeah, I am not a geologist nor a spelunker. <laughs> so the one stalag, that comes from the ground. Stalagmite with a G. Stalagmite. Okay, so there was like a rhyme not that you did as a child. Tight. Because with the C, it's from the ceiling. With the G, it's from the ground. That's what it is. Oh. That's what it is. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. We, we, do, we do have a geologist here. <laughs> There's Polunker. You're welcome. <laughs> he just has useless information that yeah. he stores in his brain. Uh, not useless. This was the use case. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> he uses a stalagmite to get the key out from the water. That's one way of approaching it. He realizes that the small bunny was not Flopsy. The big thing was Flopsy. So that's surprise number two. Surprise number three, he just had to completely change his tactic of fighting in, a, in order to get a heads up on Boomy. Well, technically, the, the surprise in number three is that he picked the frail old man and he was ripped. Ripped. That AF. too. Yeah. Both, both those things. Double surprise. <laughs> and so what I really draw from this is how wonderful it is for Aang to find somebody from his past who is still around. Because we talked... Two episodes ago, when he was at the Southern Air Temple, everybody's gone. Mm-hmm. Monk Yatso is gone. The rest of the Sky Bison, the lemurs, whatever used to be at the Southern Air Temple, they're all gone. He's the last airbender, and he knew that, and he had to accept it. He went to Omashu, hoping to relive some piece of his past, not expecting his friend to still be there, but he is there. And so now they have that moment where they're able to hug each other, and Bumi does say, it's good to see you. You haven't changed. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a a beautiful sentiment because it is hard to think through the fact that we just went through that episode of, you know, yeah, Aang feeling all alone that he hasn't really anyone in the world. And that's why he actually goes into the Avatar state because of how upset he is that everything that he's ever known is gone. And that's when Katara starts to calm him down by saying that, you know, we're here for you, though. But then ultimately he, he does have Boomy an old, old, old friend who has been around this whole time. And he is his old friend, but he also has the benefit of living those hundred years. Mm -hmm. And so he has the wisdom that he didn't have as a child either. And so, yes, he put him through these tests rather than just telling him outright who he was. Mm -hmm. And he made him think outside the box. And he says, it's because you're the avatar. You have these challenges ahead of you and you're going to have to think of different ways to approach your problems. You have to think creatively. You can't just be accepting of the way things as you've always known them. Things are different. Times have changed. Mm -hmm. Think about the situation you're in, look outside the box and adapt really. And he straight up says that you have to fight fire Lord Ozai. And And he says, I hope you think like a mad genius. And ding, 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 we know the Fire Lord's name. That's the first time it's mentioned. I was going to say. Fire Lord Ozai. I was going to say, I think that's the first clear indication besides the fact that he's going to learn all of the elements. That's the first direction of a mission that we've gotten since the beginning of the show. Right. This is giving us an end game. Yeah. He has to end this by fighting the Fire Lord. Absolutely. And I thought, I was like, ooh. Which is an amazing title, by the way. Like. Y'all can call me Fire Lord Grant at any point because that's just a that's just a great thing. I can guarantee you that's never going to happen. Fire, Fire Lord, <laughs> you're looking a little too Airbender for me right now. Oh, that's rude. That's so, fine. Like, no, I get that. <laughs> get the that's fine. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so I I meant to bring this up earlier, but I was excited because right before we hit recording, I said, "Oh yeah, I've got a thing." <gasps> And oh, I yeah. looked up a couple of names for translations. Ooh. I'll start with the less exciting one because I don't know if it has much correlation. Omashu is Japanese for mash. 
like M-A-S-H. So mashing the ground, I, that's the best connection I can make. Stomping the ground, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's loose, but it's there. And it's also possible it could translate from multiple languages. And that's just the one Google Translate picked. Also fair. That's fair. But the more exciting one is Boomi translates from Indonesian to Earth. What? what? There it is. Earth. I was excited. That was, that was all I had. That, that, was, <laughs> that was my exciting moment. Do we have any final thoughts before we get to predicting the next episode? We have to go over what... I predicted last time. Predicted oh, last yes. time for okay, this episode. So, Andrew, walk us through. What were Melanie's predictions from last I time? I think it was super short. I'm really grateful that you write these down. Because all I have is Omashu-Earthbenders. So her, her guess was that we were going to find out about Earthbenders. Crushed okay. It. So check. Good. And I believe she also thought we were going to learn more about Zuko's dad. Which we technically did. Which... Kind of, sort of. We got, his, we got his a name. name. We got a name. Whatever. I'm going to take that as a win. Yeah, sure. I, I will give it to you. Granted. The, I, I think you were hoping for a little bit more firebender action in order to learn about Zuko's dad. You don't know my but life. But either way, we did learn more about Zuko's dad. Doing pretty well, guys. I have to say. <laughs> yep. We're on episode five of 60. <laughs> Chad. No, but to your credit, yes, you did well. Okay. Let's, let's hear the next one. Okay. So the next episode is titled Imprisoned. What do you think? Hmm. I'm going to still go with the Fire Nation. I think we're going to find something out about the Fire Nation. Or we could stay with the Earthbenders since we didn't really, we touched on them a little bit, obviously with Boomy, but I don't know. I'm going to go into a little bit more, more detail there. Because well, it's little... I guess we, it's kind of what we were talking about with their temple itself. It's, it's a fortress. It's hard to get out of. You need the ability of earthbending in order to get out of there, right? So, I don't know. I, I don't know. I just felt like maybe in prison had to do with something more with the earthbending. So, let's go a little more pointed. And who do you think is imprisoned? Maybe the people that tried to penetrate the city before. Omashu? Yeah. So, they would be POWs of the Earth Kingdom. Yeah. So, they're imprisoned by the Earth Kingdom. Possibly. Okay. Anything else that you might want to glean? I mean, we, we, where do you think the trio is going? So I really wish I remembered all of his things that he wanted to do. The only Ang wanted to do off his list. The only thing I can remember is llamas. Well, keep in mind also that it's a 20 episode season and he only named oh, like four or five things. That is true. I guess I keep forgetting that it's like a startup show technically at this time and has 20 episodes already. It's crazy. Um, I don't know. I don't know where he might go. Maybe. Well, that's something that Boomy did tell him. It's like, you have to master the elements. So maybe that his next step will be him beginning to master one of the elements. Yeah. Well, Aang did say early in the episode before they were caught that airbenders honor, after they ride this slide, they'll start heading towards the Northern oh, Water yeah. Temple. That's true. Or Northern Water Tribe. So, so maybe he'll keep his promise to Katara. Possibly. And start teaching her and learning himself. Okay. So we got a couple of solid guesses. We'll see what happens. But in the meantime, that is the end of the fourth episode of Crossroads of Destiny. Thank you all for joining us. We hope that you are enjoying the show so far. Uh, we're definitely enjoying it. Absolutely. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> Here is all of our contact information. We definitely want you to reach out. It's kind of sad right now to look at our Facebook page and our Twitter profile and see like, Yay, we got two likes. And so your challenge, everybody, is to go out and like our socials, okay? <laughs> so go to facebook.com slash xroadspod. Go to xroadspod on Twitter. That is the best place because Twitter is something I like some of the time. And <laughs> <laughs> then even the best thing you can do right now, and we do have a couple of reviews to shout out on Apple Podcast. We Yay. got our first couple of reviews. And so thank you. Thank you so much to Adam Whaler and then Fat Shadow 13 for the five star reviews. And I know that you guys came from my office podcast. And so I am grateful that you have sort of followed me over here. And I hope you find just as much joy in this show as Katie and I had it in doing that show. 
So we're excited to continue and we would love to have more ratings and reviews to talk about next time we record. And so we would just love to extend the invitation to you to go to Apple podcast, drop a rating, drop a review, help spread the word because that is the best way to help out a new podcast like ours. You can email us directly feedback if you would like at xroadspod at gmail.com. And don't forget, you can leave a voicemail. We haven't received any yet, but you can call 3145 yip yip. That is 314-594-7947. If you keep it under a minute, give us something good to talk about. We might include it on the show. We would love that. And that's it. So Melanie, where can people find you online? Melanie Amanda 44 and that is on Instagram. Okay, Andrew. Go with the podcast social media. Yeah, Andrew has the Twitter on his phone at the moment. Yes. And I should say we're, we're also on Instagram. Not that I use Instagram for a whole lot, but we might post some things there every once in a while. And it's also X Roads Pod, of course. So you can follow us there too. And as far as me individually, you can follow me on Twitter at Chadadada. That is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A. You can follow my other podcast, The Cinescope Podcast, which is a movie discussion show where we talk about the movies we love and why we love them. You can find that where podcasts can be found and thecinescopepodcast.com. And my other show, which is finished, but we talked about The Office, just like we're talking about Avatar The Last Airbender now. It is called An American Workplace. You can find it on Twitter at WorkplacePod and WorkplacePodcast.com. And show notes and all contact information can be found for this show at xroadspod.com. And that is all, everybody. Thank you all for listening once again. We will see you next time in episode five when we talk about book one, chapter six, Imprisoned. Bye. Yep, yep. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.